All right, guys. Hey, welcome. Uh, we got a Chris Tarbert here from. How do you say your last name, Chris? Uh, Tarbert. Tarbert here from uh, Story Trading Community. We were going to try to get him on uh, this morning, but we had some technical difficulties. So he's here with us now uh, to give us an update on Clear Field Communications. A uh, little bit of a background on that first. Um, Clearfield is a stock. We interviewed the CEO uh, back in June, and it's up 42% since. Uh, but this is not a stock that was actually uh, presented as a VIP pick or anything. It was actually unsolicited from their investor relations firm. They came to us. They said, hey, we want to pitch a story, uh, Clearfield to your community. So we did that, and it's been uh, a really good performer since uh, she came and spoke to us. And Chris seems to be a real expert on this stock. Uh, so why don't you tell us a little bit about this company and what you expect for earnings? Here's the chart we're looking at right here. And sure. let me know if you want uh, me to pull anything up. Absolutely. Um, I'll just give a little bit of background. I've been in the telecom private equity space for 20 years. Um, I've been following Clearfield for about 12 Um there was this Clearfield was a spinoff of a, a sort of another fiber optic company, but in, in a sense, for those who don't know Clearfield, um, they do a lot of fiber management, uh, fiber protection services. Think um, a lot of the fiber boxes in your neighborhood. If you have fiber to your house and the connections uh, to your house, they don't actually provide the fiber itself, but but more of the connections. Um, they specialize in the tier two and tier three markets. My guess is they're probably running anywhere between sixty to seventy percent market share. Uh, I think they're actually increasing that market share. A lot of it's due to the fact that they have uh, inventory that their competitors don't. Um, they also have an ability to deliver very fast. I think their time to delivery is probably twice the average of some of their competitors. Um, and they've just invested a lot into their own infrastructure. Um, what's, what's sort of happened in the last six months is you know, recently they moved all operations or, or production from China to Mexico which also has sped up some of their delivery times. Um, in the last earnings call, they announced that they have tripled their capacity in Mexico and they've doubled their warehousing and distribution and their headquarters in Minnesota. So clearly they're gearing up from what they say is going to be an incredible cycle for the next four to five years. Um, as, as mentioned in the last earnings call, there's $65 billion, that's a billion with a B, coming into fiber to the home and fiber to rural development. The Rural Development Opportunity Fund alone has about, uh, I think about $20 billion coming into it. And it's important to note that all of these forecasts and the revenue that Sherry and her team have talked about do not include any of that money. So you have an avalanche of money coming in late 2022 and 2023. So when you look at their backlog numbers and what she talks about tonight, Everything for the next six months is just business that they've gotten to date. It doesn't include any of this government funding, this this tsunami of money that's that, that's coming in. So I, I got two major questions for you without knowing the business very well. Um, how do you think inflation may be? Is there a possibility that the inflation we're seeing today could somehow adversely impact either the report that's coming tonight or their guidance uh, for the rest? Sure. Well, and, and look, I mean, obviously, raw costs are, are probably going to go up. Um, the, the, she alluded to some of that in the last call, but she, I think she felt that with moving or, or building more of the operations out in Mexico, it would tend to offset that. Um, by how much? I, I don't know. We'll, we'll get more clarity tonight. The other issue that, that had kind of sort of been brought up in the last six months was potential supply chain issues. From my understanding, the, the only supply chain issues they really had was a specialty resin that they needed for some of their customers, but that had been, that, you know, I think that had been resolved in the last three months, but I think we'll get some more clarity about that tonight. And are they able of what, what kind of arrangements do they have with their customers? Are they all fixed price or, or can they pass along some of these higher input costs? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I think probably the existing customers is probably fixed. Uh, but again, you've got a, a, a boatload of revenue coming down the pike in six months. So I would assume they would adjust accordingly. Uh, but being able to answer is, I don't know. Okay. I, the, I, will, I will say that the Clearfield, Clearfield's hook, I mean, look, they've got a great customer base in tier two, tier three. Their business is very sticky. They, they don't lose customers. 
The, the other sort of opportunity that they have is, is they spent the last three or four years trying to break into the tier one market. Um, they spent a lot of money to get their products certified, which is a multi-year process and a multi-million dollar process. They've gotten to that point. I think the issues that they've had with the tier one and breaking that market is um, un, you know, unseating the incumbents that are there, right? And their, their hook is, is that by their modular design, that their systems and their implementations are so much easier to put in that the labor costs for the tier ones will go down dramatically. Now, I think they've had some push. I mean, their, their costs are so much less than the incumbents that the unions are pushing back saying, well, if you come in here and our costs are going to go down, you know, our installation costs, because man costs are a lot less, are going to go down 30, 40, 50 percent. I'm worried about losing employees. Right. But I think that there's so much business coming forth, even to the, some of the tier one providers that the unions and, and the unions and the tier one customers themselves are figuring out, OK, well, if clear one can save us so much money because their stuff is so easy to install, then we can tackle on other projects and we don't have to worry about, you know, having people sitting around, you know, on their hands with nothing to do. So, again, one of, and, and, you know, they, they talk about this a lot, but their hook is you use us. Our stuff is so much easier to install. It's so easier to train new employees to install our gear, you can see savings up of 30, 40%. Okay. Let me, I got a couple more questions. In the meantime, if anyone has any questions, I'm not sure if the chat works on the, this is an unlisted YouTube link. Um, if it does work, go ahead and throw your question in the chat. I'll see it here. Otherwise you can throw it in the WhatsApp room and, and I'll read it out that way. Um, so a couple other questions. What about, uh, I'm guessing there's no impact, but I'm going to ask anyway, what if there's a recession? uh do you see any impact to their revenue if consumer discretionary spend gets takes a hit i i don't um you know they've they've got like i guess there's a chance that you see tier ones dial back 5g deployments i don't really see them dialing back fiber to the home i think that continues there's so much again there's so much government money and funding that these providers especially in the tier two and tier three space can get so I, I, I think that's a, a small risk. I don't think it's a great risk, but I, I don't see fiber deployments slowing down. Okay. All right. Let me share with you uh, analyst estimates here. Um, you probably sure. know about these, but there's three analysts, average estimate tonight, 50 cents, 44 million revenue. So what's your positioning going into the report? Are, are you doing anything special? Are you going overweight? Are you expecting a beat? How, how are you playing the earnings tonight? All right. So there's, there's three analysts. Um, there's Lake Street, Northland, and uh, Needham. And Needham, I, you know, again, I'm, I got some bias here because I've been following the stock for a long time. I know the management team well. Needham's got the highest target on the street at 92. Um, if anyone has access to any of the reports, you can see that every single one of the analysts not 92 cents $92. for this quarter sorry sorry 92 price target 92 price oh, target oh 92 okay. my, price my target. apologies <laughs> okay and we're at 54 uh, 50, 54 50 right and and the yeah. others are in the others in the mid 70 range so okay. he, here's what i think about earnings tonight um they reported 75 cents per uh, earnings per share last quarter okay she also claimed she had a backlog of 100 million, which broke every record that they've ever had. They also broke records for gross margins and operating margins. Um, she also said out of the 100 million that she expected to ship all of that within the next six months. So, you know, if, if she could do half this quarter, half next quarter, then at, at a minimum, you're talking to 50 million. And that doesn't include all the other orders that they get and flip within that quarter. So when I look at, I've got all three annual supports right here. Every single analyst, including everybody I've talked to, knows that that's that you know she's got a history of being ultra conservative, and they even write that in in, her, in their reports that they think that this estimate is is obviously going to go massively up in the next quarter or two. So look, I, I'm I'm a long term investor. Um, you know, I have been for a long time. I'm I'm overweight the stock. Again, I, I don't know. You know, if, if potentially they have some great numbers, does it get washed out by other macro events, including Apple's, Apple earnings, which you and I sort of talked about if we, we think that may sink the market a little bit. But I'm comfortable in, in Clearfield for, for a few reasons. One, um, I think they'll crush numbers and they'll have to up guidance and the analysts will 
all redo their numbers, not only for the rest of 22, but 2023. Um, and as I stated earlier, um, none of the rural development fund, none of these other government programs are even in their numbers yet. So I think she'll probably give color to say, you know, maybe this quarter, next quarter, we can start, start talking about the impact of that, you know, for the latter half of this year and for 2023. But I just think with, with wh- how they're performing, how well they're doing, that there is this great floor under the stock. Also, last quarter, they announced they were increasing their buyback plan, right? And I think they did that for two reasons. One, because of the amount of cash flow that's coming in. And two, if you go back to the chart, you could see where the stock did a nosedive of about $10 or $15 on an analyst report, an, sort of an unknown, you know, tier three analyst who wrote a short report, knocked the stock down 10 or 15 bucks right before the last earnings call. They blew it out of the water and the analyst ran away and then stopped covering the stock because he got it completely wrong. Mm-hmm. So I, 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 invite, I, I invite everybody to go back and look at that because the guy just had egg all over his face. And not, not that he's that well regarded on Wall Street anyway. He's a little two man shop out of California. Um, so I think what they did is they might have made some tweaks to their buyback program to make it more flexible in case there's some you know, ridiculous short attack like this that really had no merit. So I think between those, I, you know, those things, you've got a, I think you've got a really comfortable floor under the stock and just a lot of ups, potential upside going on in the next, you know, six to 24 months. Cool. No, that's interesting. It, it's just so hard. I don't know for the audience here, but for me to, to get bullish about a stock in this macro environment, very hard. I hear everything you're saying. <laughs> I hear everything you're saying. It sounds very compelling and, uh, you know, you know your stuff. So I, I would bet, I would definitely bet on you here. Uh, yeah. But it's hard, right? It's hard in this environment to, to buy a new stock. Yeah, I mean, look, and, and, and you and I have sort of talked about this. I think, I think the one thing we look for is, you know, you, you try to look for no-brainers with very solid management, conservative management, management that has stakes in the game. Um, the other thing I, I'd like to, you know, call out for your viewers is, look at the chairman. Okay, the chairman owns well over 10%, right? He's never sold a share. He's continually bought over the last 12 years, ever since he became chairman of the board. Um, I don't th- I don't think you find a chairman more dedicated, you know, with his wallet than, than Ron Roth. Um, he literally almost buys every single quarter. Again, he's never sold a share. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if him and, and the rest of the management team and friendlies to the company own... 30, 40 percent of the float wouldn't be surprised. Um, so look, and, and they've made you know a lot of noise about wanting to become a billion dollar company, get more analysts on board. They've got three now. I remember the days where they had none or one. It was just hard to get anybody's attention. But with the opportunity in front of them, you know, and a conservative, you know, conservative management that that you know does what they say and say what they do and and, and got a lot of skin in the game. I don't know if it, you know there, there's not a lot of stocks I'd like to own during a recession, but this this is one that you know I just and I I feel very comfortable with and and and, and I trust the management team. Awesome, that's a, a great update. Let's take a, a one last look here at the chart. Um, let me do this a second. So yeah, wh- so why are you doing that? Here's so here's my prediction. Um, yeah, I'm look I'm looking at the latest sort of forecast. You know, they, I think they've got them basically for the next three quarters for the fiscal year around what maybe 50 cents a share. I think the, the, for the year 213, yeah. I think that's an absolute, I think that's an absolute sandbag. Um, I think there's a strong possibility that you could get in the high twos, maybe even three, you know, three bucks a share. This um, year? Yeah, this year. Oh. Well, think about it. They, they've already reported 75. So, you know, this quarter may come in, I, I'm guessing this quarter will come in between 65 and 70. Nice. Right? And then the next two quarters, I think you're over 70 again. Cool. And then if, you, if, they, if they start, let's say they start looking at 280, 290 for this year, then I think you're looking easily mid to high threes next year. So nice. here, so Ben, here's always been the, big, the biggest problem with Clearfield. What kind of multiple do you put on a company that basically, you know, is, you know, granted, especially hard plastic connectors and stuff like that. It's not a software company, Right. Um, they don't have 70 or 80% gross margins. They, they do have good gross margins. They have some of the best gross margins in the space, 
But, you know, you couple that, though, on the flip side, look at their growth rate. I mean, their growth rates are through the roof. So, you know, is it comfortable PE 30, 40, 50? I mean, it would be it'd be deserting that on their growth rate. But considering the sector they're, they're in, people may, may may hold them back a little bit. Yeah, the sector also, you know, multiple compression with the macro situation. So that, yeah, that that's a tough question. Uh, I don't know how to answer that. But here, here let's, let's just look at the technicals real quick. Uh, you see the 50 DMA. Is that the 50 DMA or the weekly? The weekly, which I actually like much better. So the 50 weekly uh, moving average, you see it's been support multiple times. One, two, three. It's hanging on to it right now. So that's a key level to keep. Uh, let's see. If it keeps that, that'll be good. You see that. You see it's been yep. keeping it the whole way. So very important. So uh, hopefully, you know, it's not going to be a miss because then it's bad news because you don't want to lose this support line. And then you see the next uh, resistance there at about 63, 62 and a half on, on the weekly. And let's just check uh, the daily here on the daily chart. Uh, yeah, actually, it's around the same. I would say like 62, 63 is the upside. And you want to hold the line right here. This is basically a support level. Um, so if you're right, this is a good place to get into the stock. And they could do 62, 63, possibly. Um, maybe some resistance there, depending on how good the results are. Maybe it goes over. But uh, definitely don't want to see a miss because it's at that critical support right now. Right. But like, like I said, with, I'd be hard-pressed to see a miss. Yeah. Because again, if you look at their look at their backlog... It was over a hundred million, and she said that you know that they would ship it within the next six months. So unless they had some sort of shipping delay, which I would be surprised. I mean, I think the floor, from at least a revenue standpoint, this this quarter is fifty million, which is right at the you know right at the analyst numbers, and that doesn't include you know any business that they picked up you know in the quarter in addition to the backlog. Awesome. Chris, you know your stuff. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you for the first time here, pitching. Pitch in your stock idea. If you have more stock ideas and other due diligence to share with us in the future, we'd love to have you. You bet. Thanks, Ben. Thanks for the time. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Good luck Bye. tonight.